my dear student colleagues and all the viewers watching this program live from facebook page and youtube channel i would like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar so today it's our 241st international physics webinar i think you have already come to know that the department of physics padma university of science and technology has started its online program including online international physics webinar we have successfully completed our 248th international physics webinar today it's our 241st international physics webinar today we would like to welcome you all to a joint session between our department department of physics padma university of science and technology and the scaula normally superior uh, pisa italy and we have with us here dr andrea ferrara professor scaula normally superior pisa italy and he has already connected with us so i'd like to welcome our speaker and he will talk about the complexity so sir uh, good morning and good afternoon here so thanks for accepting our invitation uh, uh, good uh, afternoon everybody and uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here yeah it's, it's it also my pleasure sir to host you so you can start uh, our session sir uh, so uh, the student and the viewer can interact with you by commenting uh, in the in the comment section and they can okay. ask the question and they can also join us I using this link i will uh, send the link in the comment section so anybody can join with us All so right. thanks and you can start oh thank you very much again it's a, it's a pleasure for me to be uh, to be sharing this uh, uh this hour or so with you uh, and to discuss about uh, complexity first of all let me introduce myself i'm andrea ferrara i'm working at the scuola normale superiore in pisa in italy and uh, I'm, a, I'm a physicist and in particular I am uh, I'm working in, in astrophysics and cosmology so I mostly uh, study uh, how the universe uh, develops in time, how galaxies are formed, but uh, today I decided to to discuss of something uh, which is uh, uh, general, which is uh, important not only in if you if you study the universe, but if you study many physical processes, and this is the complexity. Complexity uh, is a buzzword that appears very often in the news, but uh, we'll try to be a little uh, to define it in a rigorous way and to understand why it arises and why it is important in many physical contexts. I understand that uh, many of you are students, so I'll try to be uh, as simple as possible actually my lecture is, is very uh, it's very basic uh, but of course there, there is a lot to be uh, learned and studied about complexity so let me start right away uh, in a very smooth manner so uh, let's go back to, to history and actually European history here uh, and in particular the Roman Empire that was uh, uh, the, the, the dominant empire during uh, you know, 2000 years ago or so. And uh, so uh, there is a, a, a nice uh, uh, story about uh, uh, Cleopatra, which is a very influential woman uh, uh, that uh, was an Egyptian queen uh, that lived be uh, before Christ, uh, between 52 and 30 before Christ. And uh, uh, she was uh, engaged, she was in love with uh, the uh, governor, uh, Marc Antoine, of the Roman Eastern uh, provinces, okay? So, and uh, the Marc Antoine was trying to take the power and to, to uh, try to, to get to, into Rome and to conquer Rome, so to become the, from governor to become the emperor. But the emperor at the time, uh, or almost at the time, was uh, was uh, Ottaviano Augusto. So that was the formal emperor of the Roman Empire. So there were uh, there was a battle uh, that was uh, held in the Mediterranean Sea on the, the 30 before Christ. Uh, that had the Roman Empire, that is Ottaviano Augusto, the emperor, and the other two guys, Cleopatra and Marc Antoine, they were trying to take over. And so the two were in love, but uh, they lost uh, their battle. And so Cleopatra died soon after, and uh, Ottaviano Augusto became even stronger at the, at the head of the Roman Empire. Now, why, why am I telling you this story? Because uh, you may think that, uh, and uh, there was a, a, a thought by a very influential European philosopher, Blaise Pascal, uh, that wrote in 1669, that Cleopatra's nose, had it been shorter, the whole face of the world would have been changed. 
of course, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but uh, just the, the fact that uh, Cleopatra was, was known for uh, her beautiful nose, that probably Marc Antoine fell in love with her, and the two together tried to uh, conquer Rome. And then uh, the, many things happened after that, uh, stimulated by this uh, attempt. So it's a, it's a chance that, that Cleopatra nose was so nice and, and well shaped that uh, Pascal said uh, the whole face of the world would have been changed uh, in the opposite, in the opposite uh, case. So that emphasizes uh, uh, one of the, the key issues, uh, the key issues of the, uh, of the complexity that is the, uh, the chance, the, the role of chance and uh, tiny differences that make larger effects, as we will see soon. So, for example, to give you a more mundane example that small differences can produce big changes, consider this simple example. So, suppose you're at home and you want to go to a meeting, uh, for example, from Bangladesh, you want to come to Italy to uh, attend the meeting here in Italy. And so uh, you get organized and uh, to get here, maybe you have to wake up early at 6 a.m., then take a bus, then maybe a train, finally a plane, and you arrive here in Italy at 10.30, just in time for the meeting. All fine. But consider now a small variation on this scenario, and the first variation is that you, uh, your alarm doesn't work. You wake up at uh, 6.01, then you take the bus, uh, you miss the bus, you get on the bus at, uh, you miss the bus at 7, so you have to take the one at 7.20, and then the next train is at 8.30, but then you miss the flight, and you, you have to wait for the plane at uh, 5.30, and you arrive here at uh, 6.30, and you miss the meeting. So one minute of difference in your schedule can totally disrupt your your day uh, and uh, and so this is the 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 one important uh, point to keep in mind when we discuss about complexities that small differences can produce big changes now uh, there is another there is another fact uh, that uh, so chance is one of the aspects of uh, complexity the second the second uh, important uh, idea that complexity uh, uh, is embedding is the idea that things occur exponentially. What do we mean by that? Well, uh, there's, a, again, a famous uh, uh, small uh, but fascinating story about the power of uh, exponentials. And so this is the exponential uh, rise. Actually, uh, I would like to explain it with the exponential rise. So why am I showing this uh, chessboard here? Well, uh, the, the story says that uh, in the past, uh, we, we don't know where, where the chess game has been invented, probably, uh, probably in, in Bangladesh, in India, or, or in China. We don't know exactly, but for sure, it was known in Persia. And the uh, uh, Persian ambassador in Egypt was uh, presenting the chess game to the, uh, to the pharaoh. And the pharaoh was really, uh, uh, thrilled by, by the beauty of the game and they played the entire night. The pharaoh lost con uh, consistently, but then at the end he was so happy that he, want he wanted to reward the ambassador for uh, the fact that he, he introduced him to the, to the game. And so uh, he asked the ambassador, okay, ask me whatever you want and uh, you, will be, you will be satisfied uh, by me. And so the ambassador said, okay, uh, I'd like to have uh, uh, the following reward. So we take a rice grain and uh, you put the rice grain in each uh, square of the chessboard. So you put one in the first, two in the second, and you double the number. So you get four in the third and so on and so forth. And then the number of uh, 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 rain, uh, the, the small uh, grain rice, uh, rice grains uh, increases with uh, the number of the, of the chest. And by the time you get to the 64 uh, square, the number was incredibly large. How large was that? Well, this is easy to compute. How can we do that? So basically what we have to compute is the sum of powers uh, of two to the n. 
uh, where n goes from n equals 0 to 64. Uh, and therefore, we can count the number of grains. This is the a representation of the exponential uh, exponential rise. So what are these numbers? So you start uh, with the one grain in the uh, zero squared, and then by default, you already are 31, 8, 500, so on and so forth. And by 32, you are, we are already at 8 billion grains on the, on the chessboard. And by the time you get to the 64, you, bet you get to the incredible number of 18 billions of billions of uh, rice grains. Now, uh, as you can imagine, the request of the ambassador was totally uh, untenable. It was, it was impossible to be satisfied because if you take this number and you say that uh, a, rice of gra a grain of rice uh, weights uh, 0.03 grams roughly, then you would have 500 billions of tons of rice onto your chessboard. And keep in mind that the entire production uh, on, the, on the planet uh, per year is only seven, uh, six, 679 millions of tons, so almost 1,000 times smaller. So just uh, to say that even for us, uh, it's counterintuitive that the, that the exponential can uh, make uh, small numbers that big in such a short time. Actually, this is what happens. And so it's uh, very counterintuitive. But the exponential, the power of the exponential rise is really amazing. And unfortunately, we have uh, just experienced that with the uh, virus outbreak, for example, with the COVID-19. This is just the... Uh, one of the many curves that you can find around that was uh, at the very early phases where when the uh, in the last year around March this is uh, March or April this is uh, our European data so maybe in uh, in uh, Bangladesh it's uh, it's different but everywhere the initial initial growth of the of the virus outbreak was uh, exponential and as you see from the yellow curve so you go up from essentially uh, in, in less than one month you go from zero cases to essentially uh, almost 60,000 cases so this is really uh, amazing this is what we have and uh, as a, an exponential growth now, chance and exponential growth are two important ingredients that we are setting on the table and then we will be able to put together in a, a fully cooked meal. Now, uh, now why, uh, why are we interested in, in, in this uh, exponential growth? Because uh, there is a so-called uh, butterfly effect that uh, 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 Edward Lawrence, who was a mathematician and meteorologist, uh, discovered and pointed out. So uh, let's read uh, its own words that uh, its own words that are very uh, illuminating. So what uh, Lawrence discovered was that two states differing by imperceptible amounts may eventually evolve into two considerably different states. Uh, if then there is any error, whatever, in observing the present state, and in any real system such errors are, seem inevitable, an acceptable prediction, prediction of an instantaneous state in the distant future might well be possible. So what he's saying that if today, when we measure the position of something, uh, we, con we, we make an error in the determination of the position, this small error will make predictions in the future uh, very difficult, or, or at least uh, this error will in increase uh, very, very much. So he concludes that in view of the inevitable accuracy and incompleteness of weather observation, he was a meteorologist, as I said, precise very long range forecasting would seem to be non-existent. And we know very well that, you know, uh, because the, uh, the weather is, in fact, a chaotic system, we'll come back to this point later, uh, this applies to the predictions or to the forecast of, of the weather that uh, are very difficult to be, uh, to be performed on uh, uh, very much ahead in the future. This is simply because the, uh, the, uh, it's very difficult to measure precisely with the correct precision uh, the present state and in order to project it into the future. 
So that uh, is uh, uh, that is something. So in other, we can state it in, in different words, also using what we have just learned in the previous slides. And what we can say is that uh, basically the tiny differences that we have at the very beginning due to the errors get exponentially amplified. So uh, if you have you start with something that is, that is only slightly different. But then uh, the power of exponential comes in and uh, amplifies this amplifies these differences. That the growth is exponential is something that I have not yet shown. I will, it will become clear uh, in, uh, in a couple of slides. But for sure, we can say that these differences do not decrease. They become larger and larger. That's how uh, uh, nature uh, evolves the systems. So. Now, uh, errors uh, that have been introduced uh, by this statement by Lawrence uh, are fundamental because uh, basically what the chaos does is just to amplify uh, uncertainties or errors in the initial, initial conditions of a given system. And errors, unfortunately, are something which are inherent to the physical experiment. So there is no physical experiment uh, with no associated errors. In fact, uh, if I ask you, uh, uh, using this ruler, how long is this rectangle that I'm, that I'm plotting here in purple? Well, then, then you may say roughly 1.55 centimeters. But of course, we, we are not sure if it is 1.55 or 1.56 because our scale is not precise enough. So we say that uh, our, our rectangle is 1.55 plus or minus 0.05 uh, uh, millimeters, uh, or sorry, centimeters, which is the precision of our ruler. So uh, this is uh, a, a, an error that cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, eliminated. It is called a systematic error. Now, uh, something that uh, we uh, need to realize is that even uh, in, uh, in physical uh, well-known systems, uh, there could be uh, chaos. And uh, of course, uh, in, in astronomy, uh, in astrophysics, where we, we look at the motion of uh, celestial bodies, uh, chaos plays a very important role. So here is a sketch of uh, our solar system. And uh, we have all the planets that we uh, know and love from Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and so on and so forth. And, uh, in principle, we think that uh, these orbits are, are, are stable, so they are in this way and will remain in that way for an indefinite time. But uh, even, even our solar system is, uh, is chaotic uh, in, in, in the sense that uh, it's very hard to predict what we, these orbits will be, say, in uh, 10 million years or 100 million years, will stay the same or not. Uh, now, stable, the, the concept of stable orbit is a little bit uh, uh, not well defined in the sense that in principle there is no orbit in a multi-body system like this that is truly stable. All orbits are actually unstable in the sense that it will be, they will start to, they will start to uh, move away because uh, the systems that we are uh, usually dealing with in uh, for example, in planetary systems, are chaotic in the sense that the, their uh, chaos is introduced by the mutual interactions between the, between the bodies in the, in the system, between the planets, the planets and the sun, and then there are asteroids and so on and so forth. So how can we say that uh, the orbits of our planets are stable? Well, this is a problem that uh, uh, has been uh, for, to which uh, a lot of efforts have been devoted, and uh, actually uh, this is work that uh, some mathematicians did uh, very much in the past. And so uh, asking whether a given orbit could remain the same and therefore becomes predictable or stable, if you prefer, or if it will be affected by cows, and the precision that you for example, if you measure precisely the position of Jupiter today, uh, can you predict where Jupiter will be in 100 million years? In principle, from just a new, applying Newtonian mechanics, uh, you should say yes. But chaos arises from the fact that our 
current measurement of Jupiter is not sufficiently precise to uh, determine where it will be in 100 million years, exactly as uh, it happens for the weather forecast. And uh, now, uh, the, how long will it take for uh, the position of Jupiter to become unpredictable? This was the uh, problem that uh, a Russian a mathematician, Alexander Mikhailovich Lyapunov, uh, last century, uh, uh, work out. And in fact, this effect is uh, even more evident uh, for uh, the small bodies of, of our system or our solar system that are the asteroids. For example, if you take two asteroids and you they are initially separated by the given distance d0, and uh, at a later time, you see that the difference increases by uh, simply uh, uh, a given amount, and at some point the orbits will become uh, unpredictable. So, how long will it take uh, for these effects, uh, the chaos effects that force the asteroids to change their mutual distance uh, uh, to become important? So, uh, first of all, we have to know that the exponential comes in here because it is predicted that this uh, orbit, unstable orbits, uh, diverge exponentially. And that was the discovery of Lyapunov. And in fact, he, he managed to uh, find a simple expression for the change of the uh, distance between the two asteroids or any two body with uh, or planets, or whatever you want to, to use. And uh, so the, at the given time t, the distance between the two bodies will be equal to the initial distance, d0, times uh, an exponential that is the ratio of the time at which you do perform the measurement, and l. L is a time uh, that is called the Lyapunov time that essentially uh, defines how much the orbit is chaotic. Uh, in other words, if the divergence occurs uh, very early on, that means that uh, L is small, then the system is very chaotic. In the limit in which uh, L is very large, uh, the time is very large, then uh, essentially uh, the, the, uh, the orbits are rather stable. And then what happens, for example, for our planets, for which the Lyapunov time can be uh, extremely large. How large? Uh, it's a debated uh, matter because uh, essentially uh, it's very difficult to compute what is L for the solar system because there are so many interactions. The system is so complex that it's very hard to compute this. But uh, the estimates that we have are uh, for uh, indicate that the, the, the typical Lyapunov of times for the solar system are of the order of uh, 100 million years. While for the uh, small asteroids or, and other bodies, they could be of the order of one million years or so. So these are very ca more chaotic than the, than the planets, which is good for us because if the Earth was uh, uh, moving away uh, from, from the orbit that we are into, then for us it would become, uh, it would become quickly non-habitable and uh, we would get too close or too far from the sun. So it's good for us that at least the Earth has a relatively uh, stable, stable orbit. Now, uh, having said that, uh, the, uh, you can uh, visualize uh, the chaos in orbits in, uh, in very ways. And this is a very famous example that I'm making that has to do with what is called the Lorentz attractor. So what we are doing here is compute the orbit of a body that uh, follows a specific uh, equation that I'll show you later. Uh, and uh, so the orbit doesn't, uh, it's just that now we are getting a little bit more mathematical here uh, because uh, we are having a point that is uh, uh, essentially uh, representing not necessarily, not necessarily position. Uh, it could be any variables that you like. And so these variables that are related by differential equations uh, can uh, vary, uh, but they are not necessarily indicating the three uh, coordinates, the spatial coordinates. Could be, for example, density, temperature, and velocity, or anything you want, uh, provided that the equations that describe this uh, evolution and the same uh, mathematical structure. So let's see what happens here. 
So this is as a function of time. We are solving a set of equations that I'll show you soon uh, as a function of time. And you see that the solution tends to circulate uh, around the point that is called uh, an attractor and for obvious reason, because it attracts the solution. But at some point, uh, the, the solution start to be attracted by another, uh, another attractor uh, that is uh, sitting somewhere uh, in a different position. And, uh, uh, and so the, the, uh, there is an oscillatory behavior that uh, uh, produced this beautiful uh, butterfly-like uh, uh, shape uh, of the orbits that the orbits uh, tend to go to alternate uh, a rotation to uh, around one of the two attractors and then go to the next one. So this is called the Lorentz attractor. And uh, Lorentz uh, found it because uh, he was solving these three equations, so the differential equation x, y, and z, which are this uh, mathematical expression, but they were in his uh, physically, uh, his problem was to describe uh, the, uh, the Earth atmosphere and the heat loss and gain of the atmosphere. So uh, X, Y, and Z, that physical meaning, which is not important here, but just to let you know that basically this is something that was discovered in the framework of uh, modeling uh, uh, the, the terrestrial atmosphere and uh, the weather as well. So this is the uh, where the chaos was first uh, discovered. Now, uh, you can create these beautiful uh, pictures uh, in different ways, and depending on the equation that, that you solve, many systems uh, have indeed this uh, behavior that it's uh, unpredictable, but also recursive, because after all, you produce these shapes that, that are uh, very, very nice and very regular, even though it would be impossible to determine at exactly uh, at any given time how uh, the situation truly evolves. And the classical example of the uh, chaotic systems uh, uh, implies that has some properties that first of all uh, these chaotic systems are unpredictable as I said already so we cannot forecast where the point will be uh, uh, after some time uh, ahead in the future. They are aperiodic uh, so they, they are not like a, uh, a simple periodic motion. Uh, they are smoothly and they are order, orderly evolving and as I said at the beginning, there, this is the butterfly effect. They are very sensitive to the initial condition. So uh, the solution that I showed before would be very different if you change the initial condition. So this is the property, these are the properties of chaotic systems. Now, uh, one, uh, one example of a chaotic system, there are many examples from, from, uh, from nature. So for example, disease uh, is, a, Typically, diseases are unstable because uh, there could be an outbreak uh, uh, at, any, uh, at any moment uh, uh, and for which there is no, no cure. And fortunately, we are just witnessing uh, this uh, on Earth uh, during the, this, this time. Uh, political unrest is also unstable because people can revolt and uh, create war and actually war is a type of a chaotic system but chaos is found in many 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 systems like electrical circuits lasers uh, in the brain uh, in animal populations chemical reaction and also in the stock market so essentially uh, many many physical even non-physical systems are subject to this uh, to this behavior that will describe in the four points that I uh, discussed before. So uh, the, uh, the, 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 the point of where, the, uh, where chaos becomes uh, super uh, important uh, is uh, the so-called Mandelbrot, Mandelbrot set, which is a very uh, uh, complicated way to uh, reproduce uh, to visualize uh, chaos um, and a system which is showing this chaotic behavior that uh, uh, has uh, 
beautiful uh, realizations of, of in, in terms of visual visual uh, configurations. And for example, if we look at this famous uh, example that comes from a specific type of uh, set of equation that, that, that we are solving, you can look it up uh, if you're interested, it's called the Mandelbrot set, very famous. And so as we zoom in, sorry, uh, as we zoom in on the, on the, uh, on the figure that is like the orbits that I showed you before. This is much more complex than before. But as you see, as we zoom in and you can see the scale on the, on the right part of my slide, uh, as we, we zoom in on the details, then uh, we continue to see structure and structure as we go to smaller and smaller scales. You see that we are uh, zooming into a specific point of, of the Mandelbrot set. And this is just one view, but you could uh, zoom in on any other point and you will see roughly the same, the same thing. So you see how uh, rich is the structure that, that the, these equations and the orbits that derive from these equations uh, can produce. It's truly amazing, like discovering um, a new universe. And uh, th this, this movie could last for you know, three or four minutes and uh, it, it, it seems endless. So as long as you have a computer which is powerful enough to reproduce all these, uh, uh, these, to follow the system in such an exquisite uh, spatial resolution, then you would see all these type of, uh, of features that seem to repeat. Uh, we can see by eye that there are repeating patterns of uh, these uh, spirals and, uh, you know, uh, many, many features that uh, are truly, truly amazing. It's just like a hypnotic uh, uh, movie that you can uh, that you can look at and see how, how uh, complex is the, the, entire, the entire configuration. So uh, we can continue uh, for a long time, but uh, let's continue. So I think you've got the idea now. Um, and so, but nature as well, this is in the computer, but nature as well uses a fractal as a way to maximize a number of things. And so let me give you um, some exam as examples. So for nature, for example, we have uh, plants or leaves that form this uh, pattern structure that is similar to many that we have seen in the previous slide, uh, snowflakes, uh, the coastal lines, uh, even our lunges are, are fractal. Our brain and the, the neural structure of uh, it's uh, it's fractal. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, we also know now that the uh, viruses are are are, uh, are fractal. And actually, they are fatal just because they are fractal. Because you have to keep in mind that the uh, metabolic rates, so, so that is the aggressive power of a, of a given uh, a cell or a virus or a virus, uh, depends on the on uh, the uh, surface. For example, for a spherical cell, the metabolic rate, uh, which is the, the ability to generate energy essentially, goes like R squared, like the surface. But because uh, the because the, the fractals have this uh, uh, for the same radius have a larger area and you can see it clearly from this picture you see that the area of the coronavirus if you count also the red spots and the, and the protuberances that you see uh, from from the from the spherical shape uh, so the area for the virus is larger than R square it goes like uh, R to power D, which is uh, essentially the, the is a mathematical uh, definition of the surface for a fractal, which has a dimension which is uh, higher than uh, than than two for the surface, just because there are all these uh, uh, wiggles here that, that we see. And so the metabolic rate uh, for the virus is higher, and so it uh, it wins over the cell that is under attack. Uh, and, and they're simply becoming fatal because they produce more energy and they produce more energy because they are fractal. So nature is using uh, the fractal uh, properties in, in many smart ways. Uh, sometimes they are also dangerous for us, but they, uh, as you see in the previous picture, they produce also beautiful, beautiful configuration that, 
they, they are part of the beauty uh, of our world. So uh, now, mm, complexity, then uh, in general, we can get to uh, an idea of the complexity uh, and its relation with chaos. And so complexity uh, can be defined, and I'm, I'm just uh, using here uh, a definition that I like very much that comes from the uh, Latin that uh, complexus is the uh, Latin root that uh, means in twin. So, uh, or twisted together. So in order to have a complex system, you need to have two or more components that are joined in such a way that it's difficult to separate them. And uh, the Oxford Dictionary says that complex, complex means that it's made of usually several closely connected parts. And the sketch that I'm showing you is trying to uh, represent this idea. So we have uh, a complex system is made by uh, different components, so you have diversity that, uh, for example, we have a square, a circle, and a triangle, and this is what is uh, introducing the disorder. But then you also have connections that are deterministic among these things that try to control this diversity in some way and to create order. So we can, uh, I like very much the idea that complexity is uh, 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 a, a situation that uh, is in between uh, order and disorder, or as some people would say, is at the edge of chaos. So complex systems are always uh, oscillating between being too order or too random. And uh, in between this equilibrium then is where uh, the, 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 the chaos uh, can really uh, uh, let the systems evolve in the in that in that manner that we have seen. So uh, the, the all these concepts uh, that make a, a complex system that are based on order and disorder are very uh, intertwined with the uh, idea of chaos, which is also something that is order uh, because it's regulated by uh, deterministic equation. But at the same time, there is chaos that it, there is disorder that is introduced by the fact that uh, uh, the, the equations uh, are made in such a way that uh, they become unpredictable. And th therefore, we have a transition to, to chaos. So, uh, in the last uh, 10 minutes or less, so let me go a little bit close to see where also uh, the complexity uh, appears uh, in the universe, okay? So, uh, now, uh, this is what, what I'm showing here, is a, is a map of the universe that has been taken uh, by different uh, satellites. Uh, this is an image, the most, ancient, the most ancient picture of the universe. So it's a density, the map of the density in the universe uh, measure 380,000 years after the Big Bang. We get this information from a specific type of, uh, uh, of, uh, of radiation that is in the sky, that is pervasive of our sky. It's called the cosmic microwave background. And you can think it as a is a light echo of the uh, Big Bang explosion that we are seeing today. But that radiation uh, informs us of the conditions prevailing in the early universe uh, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And we see that uh, the universe was uh, very, pretty much uh, uh, smooth. I mean, the differences in density that you see here, the, the red and blue, correspond to denser region or less dense region. But the difference with respect to the mean is extremely tiny. It's one part in 100,000. So that means that uh, the, apart from this tiny difference, the universe was extremely smooth and simple. So there was nothing else than uh, a ball of uh, matter that was expanding uh, with, with the temperature of roughly 3,000 K at that time. And, uh, but there were, there were no structures, there were no uh, all the, the things that we see today, like uh, stars, planets, galaxies, and so on and so forth. It was pre all, everything was very smooth. So a very simple uh, initial condition. So we may think as, as this picture as the initial condition for, uh, for, the, for the universe. And indeed, matter was almost perfectly uniform, apart from these tiny differences of 10 to the minus 5. But you remember that I told you at the beginning that even this tiny difference when you uh, wake up one minute too late, then your day gets disrupted, 
And that just because of that one minute uh, difference at the very beginning that became a total mess by the end of the day, here is the same. So this very tiny fluctuations in density uh, uh, field that were present already at that time got amplified by essentially by gravity. And uh, from this very simple situation, you get something which is very complex. And what do we have? Well, we can simulate that. We can simulate how that happened and uh, how this complexity builds up from an almost uh, uniform initial state. So this is a numerical simulation performed on a supercomputer that shows uh, the evolution of the universe uh, as a function of time that you see uh, uh, denoted here in, in units of uh, billion years. So we are something like uh, uh, 50 million years after the Big Bang year. And you see that, yeah, there are some, uh, this is the density field. You see some tiny differences. There are regions that are brighter or, or, or darker, and that means that the density is slightly higher or slightly lower. And uh, the, the scale here is of the order of uh, uh, millions of light years to go from one side to the other. So let's see what happens. So we are rotating this volume to, to for visualization purposes, but as you see as the time passes, the uh, the system becomes more complex. It becomes, it creates a, a lot of structure that it was not present at the very beginning. Uh, and this is simply because uh, we are following the evolution from a simple situation to a more complex one. And the initial differences, this tiny fluctuation, get amplified constantly in uh, all this uh, structure that we, that we have, uh, that we see here on the screen. And of course, the yellow spots is where the uh, uh, most massive galaxies form. You see that gravity tends to condensate matter, that is to create regions of very high density and regions of low density, which are the so-called voids. And the galaxies are connected by filaments, uh, one to each other, through which matter uh, is transporting from one galaxy to the next one. Um, and, and so galaxies grow in, in this way because they accrete matter, they also cannibalize smaller galaxies, and all this uh, generates something that uh, is what we see today. So consider that uh, the universe uh, is today about 13.8 uh, uh, billion years of age. <clears throat> Here we are uh, roughly uh, one third of that, and, but this process continues uh, forever. Even now, uh, our galaxy is, uh, is growing and in the future, it will uh, get together with the closest one, which is the Andromeda galaxy, and they will make a new single galaxy, which is the sum of the two galaxies. So this is the process that is ongoing. Uh, <clears throat> that is creating a very complex system, which is our universe with a lot of structure on all scales, uh, starting from a condition that was uh, uh, incredibly smooth and, and boring, so very simple. So this is, uh, in some sense, is the, is the power of complexity that we see on Earth. So these are beautiful, also, uh, pictures and movies. It's beautiful to see how all this uh, went along. And in fact, it has also uh, inspired uh, artists uh, uh, that, as we'll see in a second. So, for example, this is a snapshot of the <clears throat> of the uh, simulation that I was showing you before. So we have all this sort of uh, connection between galaxies. There are galaxies that are together and they form galaxy clusters. Uh, there are tiny galaxies that were the first that form. There are voids where matter has been uh, uh, collected uh, or uh, swept away <coughs> and collected in uh, high density regions. And uh, you have filaments that connect uh, all this. All this is called the, uh, the cosmic web because it actually resembles uh, a, a, web, a web network uh, that. Uh, that we see uh, on our walls, um, but uh, as I said, it's uh, it's it's beautiful to see how complexity can emerge from simple systems, and it has also inspired uh, uh, artistic uh, 
artistic uh, uh, piece of work and uh, one that I like very much is one by Tomas Saracino and uh, this is a representation of the of the cosmic web uh, made by the natural spider so it's uh, nice to see our nature connected to the universe and the universe explaining us how we can create very complex systems starting from uh, a very simple uh, initial conditions and uh, I'll stop here Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. It's an exciting tool. So uh, we have got few questions. Uh, so if you okay. allow, we can start our discussion session, sir. Yes. Okay, well, the first one. Uh, uh, can I get out from my, Can I get out from my uh, presentation mode now, or? Yes. Yes, you, you can. You can stop. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so the first question, what is uh, chaos in orbit? Excuse me? Uh, what is the chaos in orbit? Oh, the, the, the chaos in orbit. Uh, is, uh, as exactly I was trying to explain, so the chaos uh, is the fact that uh, we cannot predict, for example, where if we measure the position of Jupiter today and we know its uh, velocity, then according to Newtonian mechanics, we, we should be able to compute where Jupiter will be, say, in one million year. In practice, uh, then uh, this is impossible because we cannot measure the current position of Jupiter with infinite precision. So whatever error we are making in the position, that will be amplified exponentially in the future, and this is the, the concept behind the Lyapunov exponent, uh, and at some point uh, the error that, I mean, our prediction will be totally useless because the error that we don't know essentially becomes uh, uh, becomes uh, un uncomputable. And so at that time, uh, th this is the, the, the how uh, chaos affects the orbits. So thank you. Uh, is there another question? Uh, so it is said every 11 years, the magnetic field of the sun flips completely. Uh, this means that the sun's north and south pole switches, switch places. Why the sun has 22 by 11 year circle? And what drives the solar cycle? And what are the effect of solar cycle of sun to earth? Are there unsolved problems about the solar cycle? And how can they be solved? Well, uh, this is a, a tough question because this is an open problem. So I don't think we understand very well the uh, the solar cycle. Of course, it has to do with the way in which uh, the 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 sun rotates internally, and of course, it's very hard for us to get uh, uh, an insight on the uh, internal structure of the sun. We can also or we can have models, and but this differential rotation of the interior and the convection. Uh, that is produced by that uh, can create uh, can create uh, can affect actually the magnetic field and that is also uh, correctly uh, as mentioned uh, also produce a flip of the of the magnetic uh, configuration. Now uh, the the effects of uh, uh, the effects of uh, of the uh, solar cycle on on the Earth uh, is as we know is a uh, uh, could be substantial and actually some people are also convinced that this has to do with the climate change because there is a, a, a cyclically the, the sun can emit a, a lot of energy in form of uh, magnetic particles that are funneled by the magnetic fields that reach the earth and also uh, radiation, uh, X-ray radiation or UV radiation that is impacting our atmosphere. So clearly there is a there is a lot of impact uh, on the sun, but again, uh, what is the if, if this has to do with, for example, with climate changes? This is uh, uh, very much debated as well. So it's good that in science we have things that we don't know yet. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, there is another question. So, uh, are glassy uh, pollutions chaotic, and what will happen to the solar system and Proxima? Century of Milky Way and Andromeda Collide. 
Yes, <laughs> uh, the, the answer to the first uh, point is yes, of course, uh, uh, galaxy dynamics is, uh, makes no exception because galaxies are made by stars and so as the planets around the sun are, uh, are governed by uh, chaotic orbits, it could be more or less chaotic, uh, as I said before, for example, the asteroids are more chaotic, are more chaotic orbits than uh, our planets, but still, even the planets uh, on, on scale of uh, 100 million years would diverge for sure from, from their orbits. And so, uh, galaxies uh, follow the same rules, and uh, they, uh, they are made of stars, so these are bodies exactly like the planets. And so, uh, yes, the galaxy collisions are chaotic, but galaxy motions themselves are chaotic. Uh, and so, what will happen? to the solar system process in Tauric, the Milky Way and Andromeda collide. Uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, galaxies are uh, mostly made of empty space. So uh, there's a lot of space in between uh, stars. And if you think for a second, simply the fact that uh, going from here to the Proxima Centauri takes uh, uh, about five uh, years, uh, the speed of the light, then uh, surely you can understand that uh, most of the space is empty. So actually, uh, the, the two galaxies will come across and uh, uh, probably, uh, it's hard to predict, but uh, probably uh, the, the planets around the sun may not even be particularly uh, particularly affected because there's no, uh, it's very unlikely that we smash against another star, uh, but the gravitational interaction would make the, the system even more chaotic. So the, 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 the degree of, uh, of chaos in the, in the solar system will increase dramatically and that, in fact, will, uh, will uh, uh, produce a very short Lyapunov of time. So maybe in a, uh, 1,000 years, the solar system is gone simply because the orbit, the stars go everywhere and they are dispersed. So the, this is the, the likely uh, fate when Andromeda and uh, the Milky Way will collide. So thank you. We have another question. So it is said magnetors have extremely strong magnetic field. So how does magnetors form? And what will happen if a planet comes near a magnetor? And uh, what will happen if a star is near a magnetor? Can a magnetor collide with a black hole? And uh, what will happen if a magnetor dies? Will a magnetor become a black hole? Wow, these are <laughs> seven <laughs> questions. <Yeah. laughs> Very common. OK, uh, magnetors are a, a particular type of uh, dead stars that are uh, uh, essentially are, are Pulsars, if you know what the pulsar is, pulsar is essentially uh, the leftover from the explosion of a, of a supernova. Not all of them, but many of them will have a, a central compact uh, uh, object which is called uh, a pulsar. And this pulsar is, uh, if this pulsar has a very large magnetic field and is spinning, then uh, this is what we would call a magnetar, so a star which uh, has, uh, is extremely uh, magnetized, very strong uh, magnetic field of the order 10 to the 15 Gauss or so. And uh, of course, if a planet comes near the magnetar, well, uh, it depends. Uh, for example, if the Earth, which has its own magnetic field, uh, comes close to a magnetar, clearly uh, will uh, I mean, our magnetic field will be probably uh, totally disrupted, and that is a problem for us because uh, the magnetic field preserves the Earth from the uh, very energetic particle particles that are coming from the sun and from other sources, and these are where they would be uh, fatal for us. And so that would be a problem. Uh, and at the same uh, star near a magnetar, could be, uh, the gravitational field it could be very strong. And uh, essentially, the, the, uh, the magnetar will strip away mass from the, from the star. And so they will create uh, you know, some uh, binary system that is connected by a flow of mass from, from the star into the magnetar. Um, and if a magnetar collides with a black hole, likely we have a mission of gravitational waves. Uh, and this is something that we have already started to see now. Uh, and the magnetar uh, become a black hole. 
in principle, if, if by accreting matter from the companion, from the star, it could get, uh, could become more and more massive, then in principle it's possible, but uh, uh, this is something that is not 100% sure, so we are still studying about that. Okay, thank you, sir. We have another question. So what causes the cosmic voids, and does it tell us about the dark energy? Yeah, the cosmic voids, as you've seen, are, are just a result of the work of gravity because gravity amplifies differences. So some place uh, that is initially, say, initially I'm saying at the time of the, uh, uh, just after the Big Bang, say, uh, places that have slightly higher density with respect to the mean will uh, have a larger gravitational field, so they start to attract matter. And places where you have a little bit less of uh, density, where they're a little bit more rarefied, lose matter. So they become uh, uh, less and less dense. And, and so the cosmic voids are just the non-linear evolution of all this. So an advanced stage of the uh, of the uh, evolution of uh, the cosmic structure, this uh, travel from uh, simplicity to or uniformity to uh, complexity that I've described. So the voids are places that have been devoided by, by matter in favor of the places where galaxies form. And uh, clearly, uh, do, can we learn about dark energy? Now, dark energy uh, yes, we can, we can learn in many ways uh, uh, about the dark energy, but of course, dark energy uh, enters the uh, Einstein uh, equation where we solve for, for uh, we produce these simulations in the same way as gravity does. And so uh, dark energy, you can think of it as a competitor to gravity. Very, very, very basically, you can think of it as a kind of uh, repulsive gravity. And of course, it tends to inflate uh, the, the universe. And of course, uh, you can see a trace of that uh, also onto voids. There are studies now they are using voids to, to study the dark energy. It's uh, something we are really on the frontier of the current research, also because dark energy has been discovered. I mean, uh, it got the Nobel Prize 10 years ago, so it's really very recent and people are working and studying uh, because we don't know much about dark energy other than it is accelerating the expansion of our universe. Yeah, thank you, sir. We have another question. Do all types of stars have solar cycle? And if sun has it, can other types of star have the solar cycle too? Well, uh, uh, truly speaking, I'm not a super expert in, in stars, but uh, the, the one condition that you have a, a solar cycle, you have to have a magnetic field that is sufficiently strong. And uh, this is mostly found in uh, low mass stars. Uh, and uh, if other stars have a solar cycle, truly speaking, uh, I'm not sure, I don't know. This is something that, uh, I'm not, I've never heard about that, but it may be that I'm, I'm just not expert enough on this. Thank you, sir. We have another question. So how does dark matter affect galaxy rotation? Uh, dark if galaxies, as we think now, uh, are all uh, embedded into uh, another fluid that we call dark matter, and we call it dark matter because uh, there is, uh, this type of matter is very different from the one that we are used to, it doesn't emit or absorb light, then uh, the idea is that every galaxy, including our own, the Milky Way, is embedded in a, in a kind of spherical uh, uh, envelope of uh, made of this dark matter and dark matter uh, the only thing that does is provide more gravity so it's like that uh, if you want to rotate uh, the rate at which a galaxy rotates is proportional to the to the mass so the uh, larger masses uh, larger galaxies typically rotate faster than small ones uh, and so if you add matter then uh, the the rotation curve at any uh, or rotation speed at any given point will tend to become uh, larger. And so uh, that is actually the way in which uh, the, the, uh, the dark matter has been discovered initially then because the rotation of, uh, the measure rotation of galaxies was not consistent with the amount of matter that we were measuring from light. And so we, we realized that uh, there is some uh, extra component. Thank you, sir. We have another question. 
So what is the structure of the universe at the Planck scale? Good question. I would like to know. <laughs> I don't know. Probably, well, actually, uh, clearly, uh, in order to answer this question, we would need to have a very good understanding of, uh, of the combination of uh, quantum mechanics and uh, general relativity, which is what is called uh, quantum gravity, for which we don't have a theory yet. Uh, it's suspected that at that point the quantum effects have become important, and uh, and uh, the, the entire all well, many of the the things that we have discussed about the, the chaos and actually it's not even chaos, but it's just quantum uncertainty is dominated by the Heisenberg principle becomes very important, and uh, so some people will say that you create a kind of a foam because the entire uh, structure both in, in Matter, matter, energy, and also time become uh, become essentially uh, dominated by quantum uh, certainty. So, uh, but other than that, I mean, we we are we can speculate, but we don't have an answer yet, truly speaking. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is another question. So, can chaos be observed in quantum gravity? Yeah, that, that is connected with the with the previous uh, previous yeah, question. Yeah. I think. Uh, I think I already answered to that. Okay, this may be the last question. Good. So, is sun's coronal heating a mystery? What does thermodynamics explain about it? See, you're very interested in the students are very interested <laughs> in the sun. Uh, well, in stars, of course. Uh, yeah. Um, yes, it's a mystery. Actually, one of the I think it is the major, the major is the, the major secret of, of, uh, of our sun because actually uh, we measure a temperature in the, in the solar corona, which is this extended envelope of the sun, which is uh, higher than what we do expect. So we, we measure temperature of uh, one million K, but it's not clear what is providing the energy to to. Uh, to produce this, this uh, to, to provide this energy. One of the possibilities, and probably uh, the, the the most uh, the most solid one for now, is uh, that this energy is provided by magnetic reconnection. That is, again, when you have uh, uh, field lines that uh, that come across, and then a process that is essentially a reconfiguration of the magnetic field that is called magnetic reconnection occurs. And while you reconfigure the, the uh, field lines, what happens is that part of the uh, en uh, of the energy that was uh, stored in the previous configuration is liberated uh, at the expense of the configuration itself. And this energy uh, is used to accelerate uh, uh, relativistic particles that eventually deposit their energy into into the gas, and therefore this is what we see as a, as a heating of the corona. Okay, thank you, sir. I have got another question, so if you allow, uh, I can take more. this may be the last one. Okay. Can I take? Yes. Okay. So, uh, why does the tabister has an uneven ring of dust orbiting it, and what is the uh, causes and uh, what does it teach us, uh, teach us maybe, uh, about star? And even what is the current? It should be teach, so, not teach. Sorry, it should. And what does it teach uh, teaches us uh, about star? Ah, so, okay. Oh, okay, now, now I understand. Um, so the, the the dust is a, is a, a ubiquitous component of uh, of the planetary system, because uh, in fact, the fact that, that you can think of the Earth as a super big uh, uh, dust grain, right? That is that is sitting here, and uh, during the during the evolution, the dust grains uh, put to, get together and uh, form rocky uh, bodies like asteroids, comets, and the planet, rocky planets. Um, and so, the, the orbiting the dust that is orbiting. Uh, around the stars is the leftover of this process and actually when we see the meteors in the sky maybe these are kind of a big rocky uh, remnants uh, or grainy remnants of uh, of uh, the, the earlier phases of the formation of the planetary system and so uh, this is caused exactly by this by the, the debris of the formation of a, of a planetary system and uh, uh, I don't know if uh, what it teaches about stars, uh, I don't know, it's a little bit too general for me to, uh, I don't understand exactly what uh, we can, I mean, 
uh, I don't know what to say about this specifically other than what I said already. Okay, sir, thank you. So as we don't have any more questions, so we can like, conclude our discussion session, sir. So yeah. it, it was a great opportunity for our students and the viewers to learn a lot of things about com complexity, uh, starting from the natural view to cosmological view. So you have explained it very uh, nicely. And that's why we got so many questions uh, on this. So thanks again. And uh, as we have discussed earlier that uh, after the COVID, if possible, we can arrange a face-to-face -face session. I will definitely uh, invite you for a face-to-face -face session. And uh, if you, you visit our beautiful country, Bangladesh, so that will be great for us. So thanks thank again, you. sir. Uh, but, uh, let me thank you for the invitation and uh, okay, yes, uh, all the students, students for the attention and let me also congratulate on this uh, great, great program which I think uh, gives the opportunity uh, to many people to, to learn about science, nature and many things and uh, of course thank you also for the invitation, I would love to come yes, and, uh, and visit. Pleasure, thank for the you nice very much. And for giving us this opportunity sir. Bye for today and hopefully in the near future we can add another webinar with you sir. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.